a lot of the presenters have said they're very nervous about speaking to all you experts and I'd like to claim to be the most nervous person but also the most excited. So why am I nervous? Because here's a room full of geneticists, even if you say that you're not, and I'm going to say, who cares about that genetic stuff? Which you're all probably going to lynch me for. And I'm really excited because um, I've been talking about this on and off since last August, um, but never actually saying how it's done because it's theoretical stuff. I've had my theoretical ideas pinched before. And so I accept it on so this is the first time I can actually tell you how it's done. Yeah, I'm very pleased. So um, this is, I'm calling the thing DNA dot, which is a name worth remembering because since it's not quite published yet, it hasn't got a DOI and things, that's, that'll be the way you can find the GitHub stuff and the paper when it gets a DOI and things like that. So remember that name if you don't remember anything else from the talk. And I'm saying I'm fixing ecology and evolution's blind spot, population size, the census size, not the effective size. So we're talking about what the ecologists care about, not what the geneticists care about. So it wounds me in my black geneticist heart, but this is what we're talking about here. Um, let's go back to old methods from the 1950s or so, make, release, recapture. You catch a hundred snails, you put a, a nail polish dot on each of them, you release them, you catch another hundred and 50 of them have got a dot, so the population size must be 200. And there's more stuff in there, a mathematical thing called the hypergeometric. And there's another method recently proposed, close kin mark recapture, where instead of recapturing the individuals, you just take one sample and you say, I've got some adults and some juveniles and they've got the same genomes and so I've recaptured the genome. Um, they're the two I'll talk about, there's other ways too. But what's it for? Well, it's really crucial. Abundance is needed for um, International Union of Conservation of Nature listing you're meant to have plus or minus 10% accuracy. Neither of those methods can produce that. I'll show you later. Um, and for pr producing biodiversity measures that have narrow confidence limits, i.e. Simpsons or Shannons, Shannons is the most commonly used abundance-based one, not species list, just presence and absence of species, which is got error bars like that. So it's, in my opinion, useless for conservation. And also in most ecology textbooks, about 75% of the chapters rely very heavily on the census size for either the mechanics or the outcomes of things like competition, predation and so forth. And then ecologists spend their lives avoiding doing most of those things in the ecology textbooks because they can't estimate population size. So let's just go through these other two methods that I'm going to talk about. First of all, the mark recapture, the dot on the snail shell. The sample sizes for plus or minus 10% precision is you need two or more samples, and each time you have to capture at least 80% of the true census size. No one can do that. So this always has very big error bars. Um, and also, you have to assume there's no, between your two or more captures, there's no birth or death or immigration or emigration, or else do a whole lot of shonky fixes for you don't know those. Um, so that's why Mark Recapture was needing to be replaced by something, and Mark Bravington came up with this thing, which is beautifully elegant. Um, a sample size is the square root of the true census size, which will usually be a lot smaller than that only gives plus or minus 30% accuracy, not the 10% we're going for. It needs individual or kin identification, quite often from the worst possible DNA, some rotten DNA out of a tiny hair on a bit of tape against a tree. Um, it's a really difficult task. And it assumes that you know the mean and variance of the family size from independent data, not from the genetic data. 
So all these things are really difficult and people have pointed out that. Um, so the new one, DNA dot, how do we do, do it? Basically, it's ridiculously simple. When I thought of it, I thought this is so incredibly simple that either someone's already done it and published it, and I've just wasted my time thinking about this this morning, or else several people have thought about it, tried it and found that it's absolutely appalling. But it turns out neither of those seems to be true. And what you do is you say, you don't need to put the um, nail polish mark on the snail shell. Populations are naturally divided into groups with marks. These ones have a C at this snip. Those ones have a T at that snip. And the same again and again and again for hundreds or thousands of loci. So they're already marked. There is a drawback there that you don't know the frequency of the marking accurately except from your sample and there's some statistical stuff called joint estimation which has to be done to deal with that but it turns out that's not a big, big problem. And the advantages are like, like CKMR, it's a single sample but also there's no need for independent knowledge of any of those things. And the genotyping only has to be good enough to estimate the allele proportions, not to identify individuals or kin. And that's nowhere near as demanding. And so how does it perform? Well, this is out of a survey of the literature on those two other methods for the uh, one and a half year period recently. <coughs> better? No, not really. It's, it's recovered now. Let's, let's see how we go. Um, so this is looking at accuracy and precision of papers in that one and a half year period that actually did any estimates of accuracy and precision. And it's, there's a huge table in the um, paper, but this is a very condensed version. And this is looking at the opposite of accuracy and precision bias which is how far your estimate is from the true value and variability which is the spread variability is the opposite of precision bias is the opposite of accuracy and so getting those to be within 10 percent um, mark recapture uh, there were three of the papers that had some sort of estimate one said no, one said maybe in, so, in some ways of looking at it, it got like that, others it didn't, and one said yes. Um, so not a very large sample. Um, for variability, no, four out of five, maybe one out of five. Close kin mark recapture, no, two out of two, and no, four out of four, um, by quite and the no's were generally by quite substantial margins they missed this target. Um, and one of these papers that said no uh, pointed out that one of the major problems was those assumptions about the mean and variance of family size and getting those wrong. The DNA dot, entirely out of simulations, these also involved simulation mostly. Um, no was six out of 36 of the simulations I did under a huge range of conditions. Yes for 30 out of 36 and that's for the bias and yes always for the confidence limits. So on this basis it works pretty well. One of the reasons I've been talking about it when I wasn't prepared to say how it was done was I was trying to get um, data from other people where they actually knew the census size for sure, they knew every individual in the population for multiple populations of the same species and we're now beginning to work on that and see whether it works and so far it seems to work well um, on um, multiple mouse populations and multiple populations of a rainforest tree called Edothea from um, Samantha Yap and others uh, mice are from Anna Lindholm. Um, so 
and we're beginning to do tests that are beyond just simulation. Um, I haven't got much to say about that yet. Um, so a summary of it is that compared to the older genetic and non-genetic methods, this is sort of a genetic method because we're using the genes, but we're totally ignoring the fact that we're genes. We just say we divide the population into these groups. We don't care about the mutation and the drift or anything like that that produced this variation. We just want it to mark the individuals. So it's sort of a genetic method. But compared to the older methods, DNA avoids most of the pitfalls of previous estimates, the lowest assumptions. It's sufficiently accurate and precise for most uses of census size. And the article has a link to an app, a point and click app, which requires Excel input and output that works on Windows, sorry, Mac users. And it requires no programming. It's also got links to various other things. Um, it hasn't got a DOI yet. It's in the journal Ecological Indicators. The title starts with DNA dot and I'm the author. So you can find it that way. Or you can go to GitHub, just on Google, say GitHub DNA dot, and you'll find um, the readme. And as soon as I have a DOI for the article, I'll put it into that readme, and so you'll be able to find the article there. And, oh, I went to burn. Very interesting talk, burn. <laughs> So, any questions? Yeah, Rob. We know your GitHub username because I can't find it on Google. W show when all in one word. Um, I, I just Googled to try the way you would find it. I tried just Googling GitHub space DNA dot and I got it like that. It depends on which browser you're using, I suppose. Thanks, Bill. Uh, can you make some comments on what type of life histories do you think that this might work better and which type of life histories this might not work? All of them should work. But um, that's impressive. I may be proved wrong later. Um, of course, like any method for, I could stand back here, like any method for estimating population size, it only applies to the portion of the population that you surveyed, or that you sampled either evenly or randomly. So if you only sampled the adults, it'll only apply to the adults. If you sampled all life stages, it'll apply to all life stages. So that partly answers your question. And Bruce. Thanks. I was just wondering if you could run through quickly the, the required data inputs that you'd need to run this. So what, are the, what, what do you actually need to have good information? You, you need to give it your data set with loci in columns of the, the point and click one. Better stand behind the speakers. Um, the point and click one is set up for diploid data. Um, so your loci are in paired columns and your individuals are in rows and I've produced it for a file which where the individuals are in random order, which they probably were anyway, and there's, you shaved off the headings of the rows and the columns, so it's just the genotype data. And then there's another little file you have to put in which says what range of census population sizes I want to try. The readme has advice about that. And also, it uses jackknife sampling um, within your sample. It'll subdivide that into the first K individuals, then from individual one to K plus one, two to K plus two, etc. You have to tell what what value the value of K will be. And I think there's one other thing. And that goes in another file, and there's just the first three 
values in the first row is these three things. And again, the README file tells you which one goes where. And that's it. <laughs>